Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Financial Issues Forum, featuring Jennifer Burns on her book, Milton Friedman, The Last Conservative. My name is Jim Kelly, and I'm director of the Gabelli Center for Global Security Analysis. On behalf of the Gabelli School of Business, welcome. As you may already know, the Financial Issues Forum is a collaboration of three partners, the Museum of American Finance, the CFA Society of New York, and the Gabelli Center for Global Security Analysis at Fordham. Our goal is to bring renowned experts from many different fields throughout the year to speak on topics and issues that are relevant to our economy, the market, and you. David Cowan, President and CEO of the Museum of American Finance, will now give a full introduction of our speaker, who will speak for about 40 minutes. Then she will address questions submitted through the question field that is located at the bottom of the video player. Please feel free to submit questions at any point during our event. We will be addressing as many as possible during the Q&A session. All attendees of today's event will be offered a digital copy of Jennifer's new book with information coming to you following our event. And now over to David. Thanks, Jim. Good to see you again. Jennifer is an associate professor of history at Stanford and a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. Her book on Ayn Rand was widely acclaimed and landed her on both The Daily Show with John Stewart and with Stephen Colbert on his show. She has written for The New York Times, The Financial Times, Bloomberg, and other media outlets. To learn more about Jennifer, simply head over to jenniferburns.org. Jennifer has now turned her attention, obviously, to Milton Friedman, whose influence and legacy continues to this day. Friedman is sometimes radically in favor and sometimes radically out of favor. And Jennifer has chosen an interesting and provocative title with not just the label conservative, but that he is the last conservative. Friedman was always good for a quote and, of course, said there is one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game. And one wonders how Milton would feel about that today in a world of corporate focus on ESG and DEI. For all things Milton Friedman, though, we are thrilled to turn to and welcome Jennifer Burns. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, David. Um, hello to the audience for Museum of American Finance. I'm really pleased to be here. I always like when I get a little more of a specialty audience and hopefully meaning I can go a bit um, quicker and deeper into my work on Milton Friedman. And, you know, with an audience um, like this, I assume that you already know something about Friedman. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about my research and about the book that I wrote. Now, it turns out this isn't the first biography of Friedman, but it is the first to be based on archival sources and to be really comprehensive and to show the story of his life from his days as a Boy Scout in Rahway, New Jersey. Here he is on the left in the rather fetching cap. Um, to the pinnacle of his career when he appeared on the cover of Time magazine uh, somewhat regularly, was a columnist for Newsweek and was really a, became a household name in the United States. So as I said, you probably don't come to this uh, talk a blank slate in terms of knowing something about Friedman. You probably know him as a Nobel Prize winning economist, made famous for his attack on the Phillips curve, for his theory of permanent income, uh, perhaps best known as the founder of monetarism, the school of thought that challenged the Keynesian synthesis and can be expressed really clearly in Friedman's famous dictum, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Or you may know him as a great champion of free markets, the author of books like Capitalism and Freedom that really articulated a new vision of how uh, markets and capitalism could work in the American system or as the star of the TV series, Free to Choose, which dominated the airwaves in 1980, the year of Ronald Reagan's election. 
Or you might know him as a policy innovator. And if we think about the list of proposals that Friedman first proposed that were really pie in the sky, wild ideas, and then became reality, it's really quite striking. So to name a few, the idea of income taxes being withheld directly from your paycheck, an armed forces that relies on uh, paid volunteers rather than a draft, state supplied educational vouchers that cover the cost of education and the whole school choice and school voucher movement that unfolded from there. Uh, the negative income tax, the forerunner of today's universal basic income. Friedman was one of the first to uh, advocate for that idea. Um, a world where international currencies float one against each other uh, rather than being fixed by their governments. All of these are ideas that Friedman floated at a very early stage, was laughed at, scoffed, and as time went on, they became reality. So you probably have a few others in mind, but I'm guessing not a lot of people knew until today that Milton Friedman was once a Boy Scout. So this is really the biographer's task to try to bring together this monumental intellect, bring it to life, show how Friedman was shaped by his times and how he in turn shaped them. And so what I want to do today is um, highlight a few episodes I cover in the book and, and really spotlight some of my major arguments about Friedman. I want to focus on three in particular. Uh, one is the consistency of Friedman's thought over time and how it, how it evolved from his early life experiences. The second is the role of women in his life and work. And the third is Friedman's impact beyond economics. So, so let me start with this uh, theme of consistency. And I started my research for this book at the University of Chicago. It's the first place I went, got on a plane, flew out to the University of Chicago and immersed myself in Friedman's intellectual world that he encountered as a young man. He came to the University of Chicago from Rahway, New Jersey. And he had you know, an unusual background for an American Jewish family. So his family was part of the large waves of migration from Eastern Europe uh, to the United States in, in the early part of the 20th century. But most of these immigrants stayed in places like Chicago or New York. And Friedman's family was different because they settled in small town America in Rahway, New Jersey. And they had a fairly um, stable home life until Friedman was 16, around 16, when his father died suddenly. So that was a, the major event of his, his young adulthood. And he was a brilliant student in Rahway's public schools. He went on a scholarship to Rutgers, and then he continued to graduate school at the University of Chicago. And so he arrived in 1932, really the worst year of the Great Depression. You know, you have um, unemployment approaching 25 percent. The bank crisis is right around the corner. And it's actually this economic crisis that propelled him to graduate school in economics. He had been thinking about uh, mathematics and becoming an actuary. But as the Great Depression unfolded, he started thinking about these bigger questions. Why is there so much poverty and so much plenty at the same time? What is happening? All around us right now. How can it be fixed? Why did it happen? So, so economics seemed like a richer way to approach these questions. And he ended up um, choosing grad school at the University of Chicago. And then he arrives, and we have to remember the Great Depression was not just an economic crisis, it was also a political crisis. Social democracy, fascism, and communism were rival systems that were on the rise that seemed to be. Um, leveling a really serious challenge to liberal democracy, to constitutional democracy. And there was a question if democracy and um, the American system could survive the pressure of this economic crisis. And so Friedman was immediately immersed in these questions when he got to Chicago, primarily through the influence of two teachers who considered themselves classical liberals. These uh, men were extremely influential on him. There's Henry Simons on the left and Frank Knight. And Simons and Knight were united in considering themselves liberals in the old fashioned sense. That is a valued individual freedom. They valued limited government. Yet at the same time, they knew the traditional way these ideas were expressed and supported politically was no longer working. 
In other words, we were en entering an era of mass democracy. We were entering an era of new um, demands and ideas being placed on the, the, the federal government system. We were entering, as I said, an era when communism is rising on the left, fascism on the right, and social democracy is a more centrist approach. And so they basically knew voters are not buying what they want to sell. They want to sell this classical liberalism. It's no longer popular. <clears throat> How could it be reformulated? The other thing that's really important that I learned in my research is that they did not believe in laissez-faire. They considered themselves um, proponents of um, government action in setting up the rules of the game, in responding to economic crisis, and not in just being hands-off. So one of the things they wanted to change was the idea that um, you could only be in favor of markets and capitalism if you were completely laissez-faire. They wanted to kind of come up with a modified question. So despite being really oriented to markets um, and capitalism, they rejected laissez-faire economics. And they were wrestling with this basic question, how do you safeguard free markets and ensure broadly shared prosperity? So Freeman comes, he's immersed immediately in these questions. And he's immediately exposed also to two Chicago responses to the Great Depression. The first is what was called the Chicago Plan. And this was a series of memos that Freeman's teachers were busy writing in the first year of graduate school. I found you know, iteration after iteration in the archives, and they were able to actually send them up into the early days of the Roosevelt administration. What is the Chicago plan? In a nutshell, it's many of the basic reforms that were adopted in the Banking Act of 1935. Um, and so, and what motivated the Chicago plan was also a worry about inequality, that what was being seen in the Great Depression was the emergence of inequality. This was very problematic. And Simons in particular felt like there had to be a way to modify capitalism to kind of slow down the stratification it was creating. OK, so the Chicago plan is focused on reforming the banking system. It's calls for the abolition of the gold standard. It calls for um, deposit insurance. It calls for rescoping the role of the Federal Reserve. And it also calls for what Simon's touted as 100% money, which would never come to pass. But 100% money is basically ending fractional reserve banking and saying that you know all banks would have to hold all deposits and then a separate set of institutions for investments would be created. So basically, this is this is not a laissez-faire approach. This is a very strong government intervention in fixing and reformulating the banking system. It would have completely changed the banking system as we know it in response to the Great Depression. And many of those reforms are adopted um, during the first years of the Roosevelt administration. So, so what you have here in one response is this sort of activist government response. And also the Chicago plan called for intensive relief spending. So this idea that, that the government had to step in and provide relief for those in the Great Depression. Secondly, though, what's really important is when Chicago professors thought about the Great Depression, they thought first and foremost about banks and money. That was how they approached it. They didn't think in terms of a broader failure of capitalism, um, you know, the exhaustion of the frontier or the exhaustion of technological development. They thought in terms of the money and banking system um, is not working right and needs to be fixed. And so these two um, ideas that Friedman inherited from Chicago, I argue, are really foundational. So first of all, trying to develop a government that is somewhere between laissez-faire and, um, and interventionist, and then also thinking about economic crisis in terms of money and banking. And so all of this, from the Chicago plan to the calls for relief, to the thinking about the, uh, the uh, uh, the causes of the Great Depression itself fits into this broader framework of how do we preserve dynamic capitalist energies and create a society that's stable, that's fair, and that isn't too riven with inequality. So, OK, so that's one piece of the puzzle is Friedman's teachers, Henry Simons and Frank Knight. But arguably, arguably more important was than his teachers was this group I called Room 7. OK, so. Um, what is room seven? So here's a picture on the left is the social sciences building at the University of Chicago, you know, beautiful kind of Gothic cherry trees. And room seven was a storeroom in the basement of this building. Now, I went and tried to find it and there's no actual room seven. So I just sort of guessed at, at which one it may have been. But who was in room seven? Well, Henry Simons was there a lot. Also, uh, Milton Friedman, um, Aaron Director, his future brother-in-law, George Stigler. 
uh, his lifelong friend, Rose Director Friedman's future wife, and Paul Samuelson, even very briefly, um, as an undergraduate in Chicago. And room seven was basically um, a storeroom that these students took over, and they would sit there and talk and jam and really create this very intense student culture. And so these bonds became lifelong relationships for Friedman. Here is room seven at the first meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society in Switzerland in 1947. Uh, Friedman is the, the, they're all wearing hats. Uh, Friedman is the shortest one. Um, Aaron Director, his brother-in-law is the one with the mustache and towering over both of them is George Stigler. So, so Friedman came out of Chicago with several things that were really durable. There's this group of friends that were um, not just friends, they were intellectual partners, they were colleagues, and they saw themselves as working together to promote a specific type of economics. This was the economics they had learned at Chicago, um, which on the one hand had that focus on money and banking, and the other hand was really oriented to what I call in the book Chicago price theory. And this is basically microeconomics, um, except at Chicago, it is embraced in a far deeper way um, and it is often used as a, a mechanism of policy as well as economic analysis. That's really uh, the Chicago innovation. And Friedman also comes out of Chicago with an interest in the monetary dimensions of economic crisis and specifically the monetary dimensions of the Great Depression. Okay, so you might be wondering, how do, how do I know this? How do I know what Friedman was thinking? How do I make this argument that what he encountered in 1932 to 1935, uh, his years at Chicago. And I should note that he actually went to Columbia for part of that time and he ended up taking his degree from Columbia. But the, the intellectual imprint of Chicago is really what's foundational. How do I know though about this? It's because I've done this archival research and I've looked at unpublished materials like letters, notes, syllabi, class plans. And he's really helped me show his thinking before he's someone who's in the public eye. So it's his private thoughts and ideas, not what he's publishing yet. So for instance, here I find a letter he writes to Aaron Director in 1941, and it includes this phrase, quote, inflation is basically a monetary phenomenon. So we see that idea going back and forth between them. Um, and and uh, then we can look at his teaching notes, also in 1940, 1941. Here he's teaching a class at the University of Wisconsin, and he's talking about business cycles, and he's talking about the Great Depression. And here's what he says, quote, public works had adverse effects on the price structure, hence no private investment. Also other business practices of the New Deal, the NRA, the SEC. So this is 1941. This is the moment when many of Friedman's peers are taking up with greater and greater interest the theories of John Maynard Keynes about the Great Depression. And these theories really are taken in the American context and shaped in a way that suggests there's been a sort of phase change in capitalism. There's a new role for the federal government in terms of stimulus spending. The action of policymaking is taxing and spending. It's no longer in money and banking. <clears throat> and um, it becomes very influential in the latter stages of the New Deal. Now, here we see Friedman at the time <clears throat> when most of his contemporaries are shifting that way, basically telling his class, I don't believe it at all. I don't think the New Deal really worked. Um, he goes to the 1937 recession, which was a really key moment for many Keynesians in saying the government needs to spend more and the recession was caused by a lack of spending. And here's how Friedman frames it, quote, we could argue that government intervention made for lack of recovery. And then he concludes, quote, the government spending argument is not convincing. So Friedman here is rejecting root and branch, the emerging Keynesian synthesis and the emerging political and economic program of the New Deal. And again, the early New Deal, the banking reforms, that's very much in the Chicago mold and it's something he supports. The later relief programs and the sort of extension uh, of broader regulations into the economy, the second New Deal, as historians call it, Friedman's much more skeptical. And again, it goes back to this question of the Great Depression and how it should be understood. And one of the interpretations that's powerful in the American context that grows up around Keynesianism, but isn't really directly from Keynes's work, is the idea of secular stagnation. 
And this idea is put forth by Alvin Hansen, who is one of Keynes's American interpreters. And it's basically the idea that with the closing of the frontier, uh, if you remember, Frederick Jackson Turner writes the famous essay in 1897, we have no more, more, no more frontier. And many economists think the the frontier and the process of westward settlement is the engine of the American economy. And there will be no more engine now that the frontier is closed. And so we'll be entering a new era that, that Hansen dubs secular stagnation and sees the Great Depression as the first act in this new era of sort of sluggish recovery and sluggish growth. And so here's Friedman traveling out to the West Coast and writing back uh, to his great friend, Arthur Burns. He wrote quite the whole West, particularly California and more particularly Southern California, gives you the feeling that the frontier is not yet gone and makes you feel like telling the stagnationites to come out and take a look. So, so I, I move over all of this to show that while there are definitely changes and evolution in Friedman's thought, there's not a revolution in his basic intellectual or political orientation. It's said very early at the University of Chicago. And so um, one, I, I, I spend time on this because there has been an idea that Friedman had some sort of conversion experience like at mid-century and he was a New Dealer and that he changed it. I just I don't find that convincing in any way. And secondly, I think it's it's really important if we're trying to understand the evolution of political ideas, the evolution of economic ideas, um, the really root and origin of the later emergence of monetarism and Friedman's later analyses of inflation and the government's role. We really need to go back to where it all came from. And it came from the Great Depression. It came from the Chicago understanding and working out of what this crisis meant and what were the appropriate responses to it. OK, so and, and I'm happy to elaborate on, on any of these these aspects here in, in uh, Q&A. So I want to uh, transition now and talk um, more about the role of women in his work. And so this was uh, very much a surprise for me in the research. It's not something I went into looking for or thought I would find. But I became more and more convinced that Friedman's collaborations with women were the secret to his success. And, uh, you know, just stepping back, I realized pretty quickly, well, wait a second, all of his major works, the monetary history of the United States, capitalism and freedom, theory of the consumption function. All of these had either a co-author or major collaborators who were women. So um, I tried to get to the bottom of this and I'll tell you a few of my thoughts. Um, one of these major collaborators was his wife, uh, Rose Friedman. And I, throughout the book, I do my best to kind of pull out Rose's influence on him and the way they work together. It's a little tricky because um, Rose destroyed many of their personal papers. So, so I do the best I can um, to kind of bring her back into the picture. Another of um, the women who were most famously collaborators with um, Friedman was Anna Schwartz. And so I've mentioned that as early as the 1940s, Friedman had this idea, a version of the, the famous dictum, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And this would be the founding idea of monetarism. So Friedman had the idea, but he didn't have the evidence. And he would make testing this hunch the major goal of his career, and it would be Anna Schwartz who did most of the actual testing. So Schwartz was a brilliant woman who had been sidelined by the sexism of most economists. And Friedman turned out to be one of the few who recognized her capacity and um, you know, was able to really treat her as an intellectual equal. So I described their partnership in some detail in the book, and I'll just try to sketch some of the broad outlines here. So Schwartz was an expert on British monetary history when Friedman first met her. Um, she had written a three volume, uh, a co-authored a three volume work on the sort of whole history of the British economy, the Bank of England. She was a staffer at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and she and Friedman were brought together by Arthur Burns, who had recently taken over the, uh, the bureau and wanted a study of monetary forces, and he got the two of them together. Now, they started piecing together a story of money in the U.S. economy. And there's a couple interesting pieces to this. One is that in the beginning, Schwartz knew way more than Friedman and actually gave him a list and said, here's what you need to read to get up to speed. So, so from the very beginning, she shaped the project. Um, and what they were trying to do was 
use an idea, again, that Friedman had encountered first in Chicago, the quantity theory of money. And this emphasizes in just it's, a, it's almost a tautology that prices are related to the amount of money circulating in the economy. And so to use the quantity theory of money, you had to literally measure the quantity of money. And so that's what Friedman and Schwartz set out to do. Now, you may have to zoom in here on your screen. I'll just try to walk you through this. This is a legal sized sheet of paper. There are hundreds, maybe even thousands of these in um, Friedman's archive. This is written in Schwartz's hand. On the top, it says vault cash. The columns are different um, types of banking institutions, whether they're Federal Reserve member banks or non-member banks or um, postal savings or different things. And then the rows are different dates. And so Schwartz has literally gone through data from different banks and is writing down the numbers, uh, the, the amount of vault cash they have, and is adding it up. And this is a piece of uh, this is a way to calculate available circulating money in the economy at different points in time. And so a couple of things to say about this. This is deeply empirical work happening at a time. This project starts in 1948, happening at a time when economics is becoming more theoretical, more mathematical, more driven by models um, derived from a few statistical or mathematical relationships. This type of work is old fashioned, it's passe. Um, it's actually quite literally women's work because this was the type of work that women economists did, this very granular, empirical, data-driven work. And as the field of economics shifted, this gets left behind. So Friedman is doing something very, very old fashioned. And to his contemporaries, it makes absolutely no sense why he would be spending his time doing this. Um, so the way the partnership works, Schwartz is in New York. She's gathering a lot of the data. She and Friedman are sending letters back and forth. This is a historian's dream because they can't afford phone calls. So everything they say to each other, most of what they say to each other is in letters. And then they have, maybe they meet once a year. This goes on for more than a decade. And it culminates in Friedman and Schwartz's magnum opus, A Monetary History of the United States. And there, there's many things to say about this book. I think it repays a read if, if you haven't uh, looked at it before. It's a sort of fascinating story of American history with a quite unusual protagonist, which is money. Um, and so the centerpiece really of the book is an analysis of the Great Depression. And all of those sheets of numbers get combined into um, simple visuals like this and this one documents a 30% drop in the stock of money over the years of the Great Depression. And this uh, uh, this episode, Friedman and Schwartz dubbed the Great Contraction because it contracted the money supply. And they argue then that the Great Depression, its depth, its length, its severity is linked to this drop in the stock of money. And, and they talk about the mechanism of it, but quickly put, it's the fact that there is no bank insurance in a fractional reserve system, when the banks start collapsing, literally money is drained out of the economy. This is why the Chicago plan called for the end of fractional reserve banking. Now, Friedman and Schwartz then are framing and arguing for the Great Depression as a monetary phenomenon linked to the banking system, not as a larger slowdown in capitalism or uh, an exhaustion of the dynamic of economic growth. Yet they also clearly understood it as an institutional and political phenomenon. And so they go on to argue that the Federal Reserve System could have and should have prevented this inflation, that it was the lender of last resort, that it could have helped those failing banks, could have kept money in the system, kept it alive. And then they diagram in some detail the kind of interpersonal dynamics and institutional dynamics that led the Federal Reserve to sort of stand by and not take an active role in addressing the crisis. Now, um, this then leads, and, and you know, I can say more on this in the Q&A, this really becomes, this book has such a massive impact um, because it's the story of what not to do. And so, you know, in the, you know, nearly 80 some years since, this has become Friedman and Schwartz has become the playbook of responding to economic crisis. In other words, nobody wants to be the Fed in 1932. 
Um, everybody wants to do what Friedman and Schwartz said the Fed should have done. So the way that we see modern Fed chairs from Greenspan to Bernanke um, to Powell reacting very quickly, um, thinking of liquidity as the most important um, thing they can provide in economic crisis, this really comes back to this research project, to this 10-year research project, to the book and to the conclusions it contained. Now, if we can see how this breakthrough is made through you know, looking in the archive and looking at the history, it's a little more um, tricky to understand why was it that Friedman developed this partnership with Anna Schwartz and why did he see something that his peers did not? Um, and I go into some detail in, in, in how terribly Schwartz was treated throughout the book. And it, it turns out that for whatever reason, Friedman simply didn't have this large blind spot that many other men of his generation did. In other words, he was able to look at someone like Anna Schwartz and see the economist first and see the woman second and not have a lot of preconceptions about what her talents or capacities would be based on her identity as women. And so it's it's really fascinating because this is not an exception. For, Schwartz is not the only one. In my book, I talk about several other women. Um, there's Rose Friedman, who I've mentioned. Um, there's Dorothy Brady, who is you know so obscure that I was not able to find a picture of her. She was um, Rose Friedman's best friend. And um, here's a quote from a letter she wrote to Friedman in 1948. Might sound familiar. Quote, fundamentally, the only real test of a theory is in reasonable, accurate prediction. And this experiment did not lead a formula that could be used for prediction. Now, this really blew my mind. This is 1948. This sounds a lot like a pretty famous essay Friedman published in 1953, The Methodology of Positive Economics. Was, you know, who, where did the ideas come from? Who said what first? I can't figure it out, but there was a lot of interchange going on there. And what's also important is that letter comes during a series of correspondence that eventually led to the theory of the consumption function. Um, this was a book that was... Uh, it's not as famous as a monetary history, but it was more technically uh, successful and had a higher impact in um, the economics profession. And it grew out of discussions between Rose Friedman, Dorothy Brady, Margaret Reed, and Milton Friedman in their summer house when um, these women who were friends of Rose would come visit and they would just talk economics nonstop. Um, now, this story has been recounted in uh, uh, briefly in the introduction. Friedman admits the role of the, these women played and, and how important the conversations were. Um, but what wasn't said and what I uncovered in my research is that Friedman was at this time trying to get both Dorothy Brady and Margaret Reed hired as his colleagues at the University of Chicago. He was locked in battle uh, with the Coles Commission economists. Um, Cole's Commission economists were at the vanguard of mathematical approaches in economics. They were really the first econometricians. They were pioneers in designing large-scale general equilibrium models. And Friedman hated everything they did. Um, he hated their economics. He disliked their politics. Many were very left-leaning. He saw uh, Margaret uh, Reed and Dorothy Brady as alternatives because they were doing the more empirical um, work, the kind of testing of theories against consumption data that he and Schwartz were doing. And so um, Friedman and originally wrote the first version of this book as a, as a memo to convince his colleagues to hire these women to show what they could contribute. Now, it, eventually Margaret Reed was hired. Dorothy Brady was not hired. She did end up at the University of Pennsylvania. Now, the other thing that's really important about this is that Friedman's immersion in consumption economics, those long charts of numbers. Um, so in, in the banking system, it's not consumption, but a lot of his other work was very similar in that you would just have columns and columns of figures and you're trying to find the patterns in the figures. Um, this was extremely rare and even singular for a male economist of his day. Um, because as I said, this was women's work. This was what uh, women focused on consumption that was thought to be an area that they could meaningfully contribute. And Friedman was one of the few uh, economists of his generation who paid attention to this. And it really enabled him to zig where others zagged. It enabled him to see things others couldn't, both methodologically and in terms of the contributions that these women could make. Now, again, it's sort of a question of biography or character, why Friedman was able to do this. I do think that one important factor is that the University of Chicago, 
had a woman economist on its faculty during the era Friedman was a student, and it was the only top economics department that had a female faculty member. So Friedman was really one of a handful of men who went through graduate school who saw a woman in a position of intellectual authority. And I think that kind of opened a space for him um, to take these women seriously and you know, modeled for Friedman a different way to understand their capacities. And I think that is really um, what ultimately made Friedman a great economist. I think if you took away all these collaborations with women, you'd have a good economist. I don't think you'd have a great economist because it was the sort of combined firepower of all their approaches and all their talents and capacities that really um, gave him the depth and the breadth and the reach gave his thought that higher impact. Okay, so um, I wanna finish by talking a little bit about Friedman's impact beyond the economics profession. And I spend a lot of time talking about the economics profession in this book. Um, you know, I talk about um, Wesley Mitchell, the founder of institutional economics and some of his doubts about Friedman, their early clashes and conflicts. I talk about Friedman's battle against the Coles Commission, which he eventually ran out of Chicago. Um, the frustration and anger other economists felt about Friedman. And what was really interesting is that especially in mid-century, there was a great desire among mainstream economists, most of whom were Keynesian, there was a great desire for unanimity because economics was coming into its power as a discipline. And it was, um, you know, had been written into the statute books following World War II that economists had to advise the president because of the legacy of the Great Depression. And Congress had to have an annual economic report and the, the economic policy committees were created in Congress. All of this really put economics into the corridors of power for the first time. And for many Keynesian ec ec economists, they felt like, great, we know exactly what to do. We can tell the policymakers to do what to do and they'll do it. Except for this one guy, Milton Friedman, who would pop up and say, no, they've got it all wrong. You should do something different. And so, um, they were furious with Friedman. Here's just a few quotes of what his peers said about him. I'll, I'll just quote from Paul Samuelson's attack upon Friedman's work and, and the quantity theory. And this is what he said in, in front of, in, to Congress while Friedman was sitting next to him. He called the quantity theory, quote, almost completely fallacious. He said it was a, quote, mystical view, a sophomore fallacy, and a fabricated concept. So that's in, uh, that's in the 1950s. After a monetary history, the tune is going to change and Friedman will become very dominant in economics. Um, but what really makes Friedman so important is that he had this impact beyond his professional field. And he had an impact on policymakers and politicians. Um, Barry Goldwater was one of the first that Friedman knew. Friedman courted him and then Goldwater eventually um, brought him on his campaign and that tremendously increased Friedman's fame. Richard Nixon also courted Milton Friedman and really cared about what Friedman thought. Now in the Nixon administration, the real vector of influence was Friedman's great friend, George Shultz. And I talk about this in some detail. They worked together particularly during the end of Bretton Woods when George Shultz became secretary of the treasury. And that's where Friedman's long ago idea about floating exchange rates really became important because now he had the ear of someone who was poised to make that possible. Now, Schultz and Friedman grew much closer together during Friedman's conflict with his lifelong friend, Arthur Burns. Oh, sorry, here's a clip of just showing how important um, Friedman was in the eyes of the New York Times at this moment. He's sort of a weird head um, taking over the world. Okay, so on to Arthur Burns. Friedman's differences with Burns are, are, are well known, um, but they first emerged <clears throat> not over questions of Federal Reserve policy, but of a more arcane policy, which was known as incomes policy. Now, Friedman had met Burns in Rutgers, and when he, as I mentioned at the beginning, Friedman lost his father at a young age, and he arrived at Rutgers soon after. He met Arthur Burns, who was one of his instructors, and they really formed a bond that was beyond student and teacher was really mentor and mentee, or even Friedman called Burns a quote, substitute father figure. So they were extremely close. And when Burns was appointed to the Fed by Nixon in January, 1970, it was widely interpreted as a victory for Friedman. This was when monetarism was really emerging as a serious challenger to Keynesianism. 
And everyone thought, you know, this would be a Friedmanite Fed. But only a few weeks in came a bombshell. Burns announced his support for incomes policy. Now, incomes policy is basically wage and price guidelines to hem in inflation. And if you support incomes policy, that means you don't believe inflation is a monetary phenomenon. You think something else is going on. And so for Friedman, this was the first time he realized the extent of his intellectual differences between himself and Arthur Burns. And it was an absolute earthquake, emotional earthquake for him. And so I talk about this in the books. He basically couldn't sleep. He wakes up after he reads these headlines. He writes the Arthur this anguished letter in the middle of the night. Um, and uh, uh, one thing he's one line he says in this letter is, quote, never in my wildest dreams did I believe that the central bank virus was so potent that it could corrupt even you in so short a time. And so, you know, I delve into this relationship more in the book. Friedman predicted that Burns would go from incomes policy to wage and price controls. He was profoundly disappointed by Burns's erratic monetary policy. The letters kept coming. What in God's name is happening? Um, and this episode, is, it's more than a falling out because it tells us something really important about Friedman. Um, it reminds us how out of the mainstream his ideas were in the early 1970s as the nation confronted the great inflation. Um, Arthur Burns, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, claimed, quote, monetary policy, I feel, has done its job fully. And since monetary policy had done its job, he then advocated for wage and price controls. So now Friedman was not the only dissenter from, from that consensus in the experience of the 70s, which shift many people towards his perspective. But it reminds us how much things had changed, that you know, in the early 1970s, the connection between Federal Reserve policy and inflation was not strongly established. Um, and over time, the combination of historical experience going from Burns's um, years to through to the Volcker shock and Friedman's ideas, which helped explain uh, what was happening, um, really shifted currents towards him and made many people open to his larger theoretical analysis and his larger politics. In the book, I talk about other political leaders. I have a chapter on Margaret Thatcher. I have a chapter on Chile. And in an epilogue, I take it up to today. And I try to point out Friedman's continued relevancy for policy today. This is obviously a hot topic. I'll just say I call my epilogue helicopter drop. And I include this graph, which you may have seen is the chart of M2 Friedman and Schwartz's favorite monetary aggregate and its spike um, in 2020. Now, I know you're wondering about the title of the book. Um, why am I calling him the last conservative? Um, you know, I have some mixed feelings about the title because I think it cuts against the grain of a major argument that Friedman is not just important to conservatives. You know, he really came to define the center, especially as the Democratic Party became more market center, market friendly. Um, you may have heard a few years ago, Joe Biden criticizing Milton Friedman, which doesn't make a lot of sense and unless you think that, oh, Milton Friedman's actually important within the Democratic Party. And this is kind of an inter-Democratic -Demo Party debate. So it's fascinating that someone who was so associated with Republican presidents is now a, like a reference point also within the Democratic Party. But there are two reasons I think this title really fits. You know, one is what I've covered in this talk, that if a conservative is one who seeks to conserve, that really fits Friedman, the economist. So from the quantity theory to empirical research, he conserved economic methodologies and approaches that were being cast aside. The second reason I call him a conservative is Friedman's political alliances, you know, his consistent connection to politicians, movements, think tanks that called themselves conservative. And, you know, Friedman doesn't fit with many aspects of conservatism, but neither did he ever distance himself from it. And in terms of the last, it's really a gesture to shifts in the contemporary conservative movement, which in many ways is defining itself against Friedman and Friedman's legacy, um, is no longer a movement that is proud to be intellectual and proud to have expertise and research-based policies, uh, a movement that shows a new suspicion of markets, a new embrace of nationalism, a new reluctance to engage in the world. Um, 
So we don't really know where all this goes, but I do know that one way to see ahead is to look back. And I hope this portrait of Friedman provides a way to do just that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was extremely enlightening. And I enjoyed hearing about the fact that he was a Boy Scout. <laughs> so, before we begin the questions, I'd like to encourage our audience to please um, ask a question. We have received uh, several of them, and we have time for some more. But let me start off with one from Danny Ahmed. In your view, what would Friedman's perspective be regarding the monetary policy actions by the Fed in managing inflation over the last couple of years? Would he be as critical as most market participants have been? Um, yeah, it's a great question. So um, I'll back up a little bit and say the changes that the Fed made to their framework, I think it was in 2019, 2018, which was a, a slight de-emphasis on inflation and a move to average inflation rather than a, a strict target and a more of a focus on unemployment. I think he would have said that that's going to get you in trouble. Um, for sure. Um, I think he also would have said this spike in M2 is going to cause inflation. Um, but then what's interesting is Freeman was known as a gradualist, especially in the Nixon administration. He said, above all, you want to gradually and slowly bring inflation down, because if you bring it down too sharply, you get a recession and you don't want a recession. So to the extent the effort towards a soft landing is a gradualist policy, I think he would be on board with that. I think where he would have really differed from the consensus is I think, you know, he would have thought team transitory was being too optimistic and it would be better to be conservative earlier and to slow down the stimulus earlier and to worry about inflation earlier. Um, but one thing what happened with the, the reason the wage and price controls came about in the Nixon administration is because Nixon lost patience with gradualism. He couldn't wait any longer. Um, and then just to add one more thought, in the case of Chile, Friedman has been associated with a shock treatment. And he explicitly said the situation in Chile is so bad, the inflation is 300 percent and higher. In this case, you have to do more quick action. Thank you as well. And I'm going to combine a couple of questions, Jennifer. Uh, Andrew Astano, this is on influences. Was Friedman influenced and or opposed to the Austrian school? And Susan Romanowski wants to know, can you please talk about his views on what Keynes taught? So how yeah. about these influences, either of them? Two great questions. The Austrian school is a tricky one. Um, so he, he was opposed to the Austrian methodology because he was empirical. Um, he was opposed to the gold standard, which be became increasingly important to Austrians. He was skeptical of the idea of competing currencies if we look at the later Hayek. At the same time, he and Hayek, I think, had a, I think Hayek had a strong influence on him. Hayek was at the University of Chicago for 10 years. The challenge is, in those 10 years, they were neighbors. So they had lots of conversations that aren't documented that we can't really trace out. But a lot of Hayekian phrases, and we go back to the Mont Pelerin Society, from the framework of competition, the rules of the game, um, you know, thinking about changing the sort of constitutional order, whether that be um, a balanced budget amendment as opposed to policy. I think a lot of these are Hayekian frames that he picked up, although I have to say Simons and Hayek were very close and there was a lot of idea exchange between Simons and Hayek. So the lines of influence aren't particularly clear. But I, on the question of money, inflation, banking, the Austrians and Friedman are, are very different. On the broader political economy, they do have a convergence. In terms of Keynes, Friedman would say Keynes was a great economist. Um, he didn't get everything right. And so he didn't, Friedman didn't think that economics needed to be redefined in the way that Keynes attempted to do. And I also really distinguish in the book, there's John Maynard Keynes, a historical figure. Then there's American Keynesianism, which is a, a American economists who see themselves as inspired by Keynes, but don't always agree with him. So there's like this famous anecdote when Keynes goes to Washington, D.C. during the war and he comes back to London and he says to his friend, I was at a dinner in D.C. I was the only non-Keynesian there. <laughs> um, so, um, so yes, but, but Friedman ends up erecting his whole system of thought in opposition to the American version of Keynesianism. What's really interesting is he and Keynes were very simpatico on opposing Keynes 
too much math and economics. They were exactly the same methodologically. Um, and so, but Keynes dies in 1946 and the people who pick up his ideas, take them into the mathematical modeling uh, direction. And so um, that's a very interesting, could have been if, if Keynes hadn't passed away, what his legacy would look like. Okay. Jennifer, here's a question from Alexander Prokopenka. Friedman was an advocate, not only of economic liberalism, but also the proponent of political democracy. What were his thoughts be, if any, about the involvement of combined tendencies, the totalitarian, totalitarian capitalism of China and or Russia? Are these forms sustainable? Yeah, that's a great question. So in his lifetime, the big object lesson for him was the experience of Chile, which went through a military dictatorship, instituted a capitalist system, and then moved away from the military dictatorship towards democracy. And Friedman was very happy with this scenario, and he believed that there was a connection between what he called economic freedom and political freedom, and that these two went together, and that experience demonstrated it. And he thought that China was on that path as well. He said, there'll be more Tiananmen's, eventually it'll fall apart. And of course, he lived through the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So all this made perfect sense to him. Towards the end of his life, you see him wrestling a little bit with this idea as he's looking at the countries that were called like the Asian tigers, the Singapore, Hong Kong, and he's noticing well, they're capitalist, but they don't have the same democratic freedoms that that we have, and and maybe this is going to work. So I would say his thinking was evolving. I think that he came of age in the Cold War, and he believed in the the symmetry of freedom and capitalism, and he thought he saw that happening in the world. I think today um, he might revise his opinion because he had not seen. Um, the ability of modern governments to use modern technology and surveillance and liberalize just enough to take the edge off people's misery and then go no further. Um, so I think I think that's a question that he didn't have enough information to really answer. He would be hopeful, though, that that still that dynamic of of economic freedom leading people to want personal freedom would still be at work. Just maybe it would take longer. Uh, Susan Weed asked something that's on a lot of our students' minds, which is, what would Friedman think of crypto and digital central bank currencies? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think um, it's interesting in one way you could think of, is crypto another version of 100% money um, in that it's not, you know, you, you have what you have in your account. It's not being lent out. And so he always thought that was a potentially very stable way to run a banking system. Um, his really, his version, his approach to, to, um, competing currencies was like, sure, you could have competing currencies, but eventually there's so many incentives to have one central currency. That's just what's going to happen. And he really saw the state as foundational to money creation. Um, so that's kind of where the state comes from. That's one of the state's roles, um, to ensure a stable and consistent, um, uh, monetary base that everyone agrees on. And even if you try to proliferate with like 20 different currencies, in the end, what's going to happen is what sort of happened globally, that a lot of nations have converged on the dollar as the reserve currency, that that's sort of essentially what will happen. So I don't think he would have quite the same utopian belief that is sometimes in um, these ideas. He'd be open to the experimentation, but I don't think he would consider it really necessary or that it was going to you know, have a permanent change. Uh, Jason Trenard asks, at one point, Friedman argued that inflation perversely created a great opportunity, at least politically, to fight the inexorable growth of government. In that sense, did Friedman ever express any regrets regarding his role in creating tax withholding? What was his role in developing the practice? Yeah, that's really interesting. So um, Rose was really upset about that, and Rose tended to blame him. Um, what I found with that is Freeman was a pretty low level employee in the treasury. And so um, the question it, uh, the question arose during World War II that ha what the income tax prior to World War II only hit a small percentage of very high income earners. In order to finance the war, it, there needed to be a mass taxation system. The other challenge um, around the war was that um, there was so much rationing and there was so much spending going into um, 
government uh, going into war material. And then people were making good money for working in those factories, but you couldn't buy a lot of consumer goods because those were all, all that was being shifted. So you had this scenario unfolding of too much money, too few goods because of the wartime economy. And so taxation was both a way to fund the war and a way to pull people's money out of the economy to reduce inflation. This is when people get confused and say, oh, that proves Friedman was a Keynesian because he was trying to tax to prevent inflation. But it was really only in the context of the war. The other context is the, uh, the alternative to taxation was price controls, more rationing, more edicts, which Friedman was opposed to. So he went into this work thinking, my work on the taxation system is a contribution to the war economy and it's better than the alternatives and I'm totally fine with it. And so, but he was not in a position to argue against the policy or really argue for the policy. He was working for the Treasury Department. He was working for Henry Morgenthau. He was in like a non keynes it was actually a bastion of anti-Keynesians. And he went out and he interviewed people and he figured out how to make the policy work. So he was really a technician. Um, but that didn't stop Rose from blaming him <laughs> for it later on. Um, and, you know, that is a really big transition. Again, it happened during wartime. And once you brought everyone into the mass taxation system, that really changed the political economy of government and of taxation. And you're now, you know, you have a tax base that has to rest really on the middle class um, in order to get the, the kind of um, funding was needed for that type of war. Kamir Hazave, you showed the M2 chart at the end. There is a competing explanation for the recent inflation surge, which is based on the size of government deficits. Are these ideas related? How did Friedman view the role of government deficits in stoking inflation? Yeah, it's interesting. So Friedman became more open to deficits across the 1980s. And he basically said deficits don't are not inherently inflationary. They're only inherently inflationary if um, governments allow inflation to reduce the deficit. So he didn't see them as intrinsically correlated um, other than with the political decision making that might follow. At the same time, so what you see in the 1980s is he becomes more open to deficits as they become more embedded in Reagan's policy and economics. In the beginning, he assumes that there'll be a lot of spending cuts. When there's not a lot of spending cuts and deficits emerge, he becomes okay with them because he decides, this is similar to the last question, well, he believes that the deficit will eventually rein in government spending, that eventually politicians will be like, we can't spend anymore. So again, he didn't live to see a world in which that doesn't seem to be happening, that there doesn't seem to be a reaction um, against it. So I think he would, at this stage, given the level of deficits, he would be worried, but I can't be sure. I think he would think, okay, eventually we're gonna, this is gonna lead to a sort of crisis situation, which we have to make really severe cuts. In terms of the M2 chart, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of different interpretations. I think he tends would tend to take the sort of 30,000 foot view. Um, this is a helicopter drop. We gave people money. We needed to give people money because the economy had crashed. I do think he would have supported the first couple rounds of stimulus. But if you look at his essay, it's like he is this essay, what he calls where the helicopter drop concept comes from when he's like, what do you do if you need inflation? You give people money like you just hand it to them and then you'll get inflation. Um, and he said, sure, sometimes you need inflation. And so this was like a sort of thought experiment. And that's basically essentially what happened. And his the concept underlying it is his belief that people generally hold the amount of money they want to hold. And if you give them a bunch of new money, that doesn't change the amount of money they want to hold. So they just spend it. And so that's when you have the price rise. So it's it's pretty clear cut under his system why that would happen. Now, of course, there are many other factors, supply chain, bottlenecks, et cetera, et cetera, that could be part of it. But it's it's a very clear cut. The Friedman analysis, if you were following that, would have been like, we got to be really careful about this. And what's interesting is that was completely dismissed until the inflation emerged. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, what did that guy say so long ago, back in the 1970s? So. Well, unfortunately, I think we're running out of time, Jennifer. On behalf of everyone, I would just like to thank you so much for for sharing your wisdom with us on the subject and invite everyone to join us next week to um, another Financial Issues Forum session on Wednesday for Dan Shulman on the Money Kings. Yep.
Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you as well. Jenniferburns.org. You can find all sorts of stuff more about Jennifer. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Great questions. I appreciate your attention.